So, uh, thank you for attending uh, this session. First of all, I would apologize because my oral English is much worse than my written English, but I hope that you would survive to this experience anyway. So, uh, the topic uh, I'm going to talk about is uh, outward foreign direct investment and multinational companies from the BRICS. BRICS means Brazil, Russia, India, and China and new wave emerging countries and you will discover in a few minutes why, what does I mean, why do I mean with uh, this mix, new concept, okay? So first, uh, the, this presentation is based on two published, already published papers. One has been published in the European Journal of Comparative Economics in 2016, okay, uh, about outward uh, foreign direct investment. So in what follows, uh, I would say OFDI for outward foreign direct investment uh, from BRIC countries, comparing strategies of Brazilian, Russian, Indian, and Chinese multinational companies. In what follows, MNC will stand for multinational companies, OFDI, MNCs, okay? Uh, <coughs> this is not, uh, so in fact, these two papers are extracted from a series of papers that I have published for, I started up for roughly one decade ago, okay? So uh, the last paper has been published, it is not mentioned here, uh, last month or two months ago in the Russian Journal of Economics for the Russians in Vaprose Economiki, but now it's published in English, okay? And it is about OFDI from transition, from post-communist transi transition economies. So I will not talk about this paper, <coughs> but I would talk about the one about the BRICS. And the second one has been published in the Chinese Business Review in the US. A new wave emerging multinational companies, the determinants of their outward foreign direct investment published last year, <coughs> roughly six months ago. To the best of my knowledge, the second paper is the only one in this area. It's a front-running paper. Nobody has published about that. The only thing that I have found in the past two months is a paper in transnational corporations. So if you don't know what is transnational corporations, this is the journal published by UNTAD, okay, by, by the UN. <coughs> and uh, they have published in the last issue a paper uh, on a cross-border OFDI between Asian countries, which cover a part of my sample, but just a part of my sample. So <coughs> the, the second paper is brand new. It's a brand new product for you, okay? And for anyone. Uh, so <coughs> what I intend to do in 45 minutes, so if I, I have no time enough, I will skip out the eighth point, but I would start up de delineating the country samples, the two samples. Then I would talk about uh, emergence of multinational companies based in the BRICS and in the NWIX, this new WIX. NWIX. Uh, <coughs> the third point would be about the development and significance of this phenomenon in the recent years, with distinguishing two steps or two phases. One is the roaring 2000s until 2007, when OFDI from these regions or from these countries developed very fast. And then, since 2008, how they have muddled through the crisis, okay? The fourth point would be to check a, f a few specificities of OFDI and MNCs from the BRICS and from the new emerging and the new wave emerging countries. Uh, in a fifth point, I will just present briefly some uh, aspect of the geographical and industrial distribution <coughs> of OFDI. In point six, I will remind you the theoretical background that I'm using, which is the Dunning's IDP model. IDP stands for Investment Development Path, okay? And the seventh point would be about my own econometric model uh, in which I have tested the determinants of uh, OFDI from the new wave uh, economic, uh, uh, new wave emerging countries. <coughs> and if, if I'm left with uh, enough time, a few words in conclusion about uh, OFDI 
promotion policies in these emerging countries. So let me start with the first point, del delineating the two country samples. BRICS uh, is very well known since the, two, since the early 2000s when a banker, I think from Goldman Sachs, said, OK, I, I found that four big countries are many things in common, Brazil, Russia, India, and, uh, and China. <coughs> in fact, everything is not in common uh, because you, you have in this sample two biggest emerging countries and fastest growing economies in the 2000s, which are China and India. And on the other hand, you have two post-communist transition economies, or someone, some people call them crony capitalisms, whatever you want, but which are, uh, so I said the first, the first two are Brazil and India, and the, first, the, last, uh, the two last, or the two latter, are uh, China and Russia. So two have a communist past, two were, let's say, uh, uh, countries dominated by uh, world capitalism or whatever you want. So this is clear for these four, country, for these four countries. Now, what about the NWICs, new wave economic countries, the emerging countries? So you have a number of samples gathering different samples of emerging economies. The World Bank has its own sample. The OECD has another sample. Goldman Sachs has a, another sample. <coughs> the, the BNP Paribas uh, French Bank has another sample, and so on and so forth. So which one I have to take? So I decided to take no one of them and to build up my own sample. <coughs> and I proceeded as follows. So first I decided to consider that uh, <coughs> a country is a significant investor abroad if in 2014 it has invested <coughs> at least $1 billion of foreign direct investment abroad and if you take this criterion, <coughs> you find in the UN database 91 countries, okay? <coughs> but in these 91 countries, all are not emerging economies. Because in these 91 countries, you find 30 developed market economies. So I simply define them as countries with a GNI, which means gross national income per capita, <coughs> higher than $20,000. So I skipped out these 30 countries from the sample, obviously. <coughs> then I put aside the four BRICS, and also because they are in the other sample, and I put aside South Africa, which from time to time is considered also as a BRIC. Okay? <coughs> then I subtracted 16 post-communist economies, because it's another sample on which I I'm working and I have published in another journal, okay? So I skipped out them for this reason. <coughs> and then I was left with uh, 17 countries which are oil and gas rent depending countries. So they are not really emerging countries because they have no industrialization process, you know? <coughs> they are simply rent economies. So I've <coughs> let's say Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and so on and so forth. They are very rich. They have high GNI per capita, but they are neither developed nor emerging countries. <coughs> and uh, I skipped out, finally, 10 small countries which are, that have coined tax-friendly small economies, which are <coughs> either tax havens or free trade zones. <coughs> and then I was left, could I have some, some water? If it's possible, I don't know. Uh, and I was just I was left with 13 countries, only 13 countries that I have coined the NWICs, and you will see them in table one. So I will not comment uh, this table in detail. You you can get the slides. I imagine you can uh, you can uh, read my papers as well, but I will just mention them. In this table, the 13 countries are ranked according to uh, the significance of their 
OFDI stock in 2014. So Malaysia first, Mexico, Chile, Thailand, Colombia, Turkey, Argentina, Philippines, Indonesia, Nigeria, Egypt, Iran, Pakistan. You could check anywhere, you, didn't, you would not find the, a similar sample. It's unique, it's my own, okay? But is it a relevant sample? So is it homogeneous in, in a sense? Is it a, at least as homogeneous as the BRICS sample, okay? So I calculated, this is not in the slides, it's in the paper, you, I calculated for a number of variables the mean, I, I, think, I mean the, the average value, and the standard deviation for a number of variables, and then I calculated wh what is called coefficient of variation, which is the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean. Okay? And uh, the lower this ratio, the, the more homogeneous is the sample. Okay? And what I found is that the Nwix sample it has a lower coefficient of variation than any other of my samples. I mean, post-communist economies, run depending countries, etc., etc. So it's the most homogeneous sample with the BRICS one. So the NWIX sample is has a lower coefficient of variation than the BRICS as regard population, GDP, and GDP growth rate. And it has a higher coefficient of variation than the BRICS for uh, OFDI stock, GNI per capita, and geographical size. So in a sense, it's as homogeneous as the BRICS sample. And I kept it like it is. <coughs> and I would say, to finish with this first point, that UNWIC, a new wave emerging country, is a kind of small brick on average. So on average, if you take the average of my 13 countries, you find that the average non-existing, as any average, the non-existing average NWIC is a country of 108 million inhabitants as against 752 million inhabitants in the average BRIC. GNI per capita in the NWICs, $7,356 per inhabitant as compared with the BRICS, 8,430, not very far. <coughs> Average growth rate over the, f uh, the four last years when I was doing the study, 4.2% in the NWICS as against 4.8% in the BRICS. <coughs> Geographical size for the NWICS, uh, 1,100 uh, something square kilometers. And in this respect, they are much smaller than the BRICS, 9,700 uh, square kilometers. And also, they are smaller in terms of OFDI stock. Only $48 billion uh, invested abroad as compared to 400 for the BRICS. So this is for the samples. What about the emergence of MNCs based in the BRICS and the NWICs? So with regards to the BRICS, <coughs> what we can check if you look at the literature and the history is that Indian firms started up investing abroad in the 1960s. <coughs> I even found one foreign investment by the Indian firm Birla in Ethiopia as early as 1955. Okay? So, the, fir the front runners, the first. <coughs> then Brazilian firms started investing abroad in the 1970s, including Petrobras, Odebrecht, Embraer, the big uh, Brazilian companies today. <coughs> then the next one is China. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> very much. Uh, so uh, China, in, from China, companies were allowed to invest abroad only in 19, since 1979. So the first investment dates back to 1979. And in Russia, Russia was non-existing as a country uh, before 1990. Or, or it was in, in the 19th century, of course, but otherwise we, we had the Soviet Union. So 
Russia started up, I mean, Russian firms started up investing <coughs> abroad in 1993. <coughs> As regards the NUICs, uh, we have to distinguish the Latin American companies, uh, which are coined usually multilatinas in Spanish, okay, uh, <coughs> which are multinational companies from Mexico, Chile, Colombia, and Argentina, in my sample, <coughs> and they started up investing abroad in the 1970s, just like uh, the, the Brazilian firms in the BRICS, okay? For the rest of the sample, <coughs> firms started up investing abroad in the 1980s, with two exceptions, Iranian firms uh, invested abroad uh, not, early than the 19, not earlier than the 1990s, <coughs> and Vietnam invested abroad only uh, since uh, 2007, and Vietnam entered in my sample only in 2014, when they reached, when the investment reached the threshold of one billion dollar invested abroad. <coughs> so, in practical terms, I have not 13 countries, but 12, because I cannot work with Vietnam. There is just one relevant year, okay? So, in fact, my sample is shrunk to, to 12. <coughs> so, here you can see the evolution of this outward FDI stock from Brazil, Russia, and India, and China. <coughs> I would not comment on these slides, you can take them at home and, and look at them. The only thing I would mention is that I'm concerned in these papers by only mainland China and, non, and not China plus Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a specific issue. I, I will tell a few words about that uh, further, okay? And you have the same <coughs> kind of table for the NWICs. So I would not comment extensively uh, on these uh, tables, but I would summarize uh, what we can uh, take out of these uh, tables in this point three. Distinguishing the roaring uh, 2000s until 2007 included, and another stage of that I would call uh, muddling through the crisis. So before the crisis, until 2007, the two fastest uh, countries in terms of investing abroad uh, as regards the, the rate of growth of their foreign investment were Russia and India, the fastest in the world for over seven years, eight years. And due to this extremely fast growth, they nearly closed the gap or they reduced the gap uh, respectively with China's uh, OFDI and Brazil's OFDI. I mean, in, in India to Brazil and Russia to China, okay? But if we look at my NUIC sample, we can see that there were countries which OFDI was growing even faster than in Ch that from China and from Brazil. There are Indonesia, Mexico, Turkey, Iran, and slightly uh, lower, Malaysia, Egypt, Thailand and Colombia. So it means that even China, the big shot in terms of investing abroad, was ranked behind, was lagging behind this kind of countries. Interesting, in terms of growth or speed, okay? Now came the crisis and uh, so, uh, just to finish, in the NUIC sample, you have only Pakistan, Chile, Nigeria, Argentina and Philippines. Uh, the OFTI stock of which has been multiplied by uh, uh, less than 2.5 over six, eight, seven or eight years. Multiplied by 2.5 times, okay? Very fast growth. So the crisis unevenly affected OFDI stock in my two samples. So the most affected country in this respect and the most unstable are OFDI from Russia. Uh, we can see that in the tables that I have not commented. And uh, the one which is not affected at all among the BRICS is China. China continued investing abroad at the same pace as 
before the crisis. No crisis in China. Even in the mainland Chinese economy, no crisis. I visited it uh, two years ago again. So it's not an economy sinking into a crisis. Okay, and their OFDI are not sinking into the crisis either. Okay, Brazil <coughs> and India are in between. Okay, and if we look at the NUIX sample, uh, the growth of their OFDI has slightly been slowed down during the crisis. And it has even accelerated in countries like Thailand, Philippines, Colombia, Egypt. So during the crisis, you have at least four new emerging countries which invest more abroad than before the crisis at a faster pace. Okay? So this is for my fourth point. The, four, uh, the fourth point is about the specificities of OFDI and MNCs from my two samples. So I would ask you to accept uh, temporarily to a double assumption, uh, which is in line with Dunning's model that I would present in a few minutes. Okay? <clears throat> so the, the idea is the following in the Dunning's model. A country's economic development stage is associated with an emerging country when its OFDI reaches some threshold. But Dunning did not tell much more about the threshold. So in a paper that I have published in 2003 in Transnational Corporations, I've decided to give a, a, a figure for this threshold. And I said, OK, I would consider uh, a country as an emerging country if the ratio between its OFDI stock to GDP would be bigger, higher than 5%. Okay? And I would consider that it should be uh, also uh, like an outward to inward OFDI stock ratio over 25%. This has been published by the UN, so you can consider that it is more, more or less validated internationally. Okay? <coughs> so if we look at these two thresholds, you see that the, as regards to the ratio of OFDI to GDP, <coughs> and uh, whether it is at 5% or not, uh, it has reached 5% in the early 2000s for OFDI from Russia and from Brazil. And in 2011 for OFDI from China and India. When I turn to the NUIX sample, Malaysia at this ratio over 20% already in 2000. So it means that Malaysia is even ahead of Russia and Brazil. So my, my feeling is that uh, better than China, Russia, you have Malaysia. The main significant in, uh, eco in economic terms emerging country is Malaysia and not China as it is often advocated or uh, contended. Okay? Uh, also, uh, Ch Chile was over 15% in 2000, and Argentina and Nigeri Nigeria were over the threshold in 2000. <coughs> and if we look at the threshold in 2014, then uh, some new countries have reached the threshold, Colombia, Mexico, Philippines, Thailand, and Turkey. Okay? If I look now to the second threshold, 20 25% for the outward to inward OFDI ratio, this threshold had been reached by Russia before 1999, so in the mid-90s, okay? <coughs> it was reached by Brazil, India, and China before 2007. And <coughs> in the new example, in, in 2000, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, and Malaysia were over the threshold already. And if I look at 2014, uh, they have been joined by Mexico, Philippines, and Thailand. So it means that the NUICs are behaving just like the BRICS as far as OFDI is concerned. Okay? So this is the table with all the figures that I have just commented. <coughs> and uh, this is the same table, more complicated for the 13 NUICs. So 
there are some other specificities of emerging multinationals that you can see in table three. So the first one is the type or the, the style of <coughs> multinational companies which have emerged in the different countries. Here, the table is for the, the BRICS only, okay? So from Brazil, what we witness is that companies investing abroad from Brazil are either global players, <coughs> which means companies competing with all the global multinationals, like Petrobras, Odebrecht, Embraer, and so on and so forth, Valle do, et cetera, and some others, okay? <coughs> or the rest of the companies investing abroad from Brazil are small and medium-sized companies, okay? <coughs> from Russia, uh, what is, what I'm used to say is, uh, from so let, let me continue this way, from uh, India. In India, <coughs> the major part of companies which have invested abroad are either conglomerates, which date back to the 50s, which have been created in the 50s, or uh, family capital groups, uh, uh, like Mahindra and Mahindra. They are two brothers, okay? So, uh, this is the case of India. <coughs> from Russia, the companies which started investing abroad from Russia at the beginning could be coined or qualified as companies with an opaque or non-transparent governance. They were so much no transparent that they were not delivering their data to the UN. Okay, the only case in the history. Okay, and step by, st by step, they, are, they have been changing into more globalized companies with now <coughs> some uh, global strategies. I will, I will talk about that in a few minutes. <coughs> and the specificity of uh, Chinese multinational is that they are pred pre pred predominantly state-owned companies. Uh, I would come back to this issue afterwards, okay? so. You have these kind of specificities. You have some other specificities. <coughs> I would comment some of them uh, in a few minutes. But uh, what I would check here in table three, in all these bricks, so when, when you invest abroad, you have two entry modes, basically. One is greenfield investment. Okay, You build up a brand new factory. This is greenfield investment. But you, you have another way of investing abroad, which is to merge a foreign company. I'm a Russian company. I intend to enter uh, the French market. I would merge a French company. This is called transborder mergers and acquisitions in American English for mergers. Okay. <coughs> so it means that in all these uh, BRICS, many, the majority of companies have a strategy of expanding abroad through transborder mergers and acquisitions rather than greenfield. <coughs> Round tripping, I will comment it in a few minutes. So the, prop the proportion of state-owned companies among those investing abroad is very significant in China, as I told you before. It's significant in Russia and less significant in, in Brazil and India. <coughs> is, is a privatization privatization drive uh, played a significant role in pushing up the companies abroad. The response is uh, <coughs> very, very much in Russia, uh, to some extent in India and Brazil, and practically never in China, because in China, the privatization drive is still to come, basically, is still to come. <coughs> Home monopolies. The, those companies investing abroad are their uh, monopolies in their domestic economy. So very much in Russia, it's still signifi significant in China and Brazil, less significant in India, which is a, more, a country more open to competition. <coughs> and a few words about governance, transparency, extremely low in Russia, extremely low in China, Rather good in India, I would say, rather good 
is an overestimation, okay? <laughs> and low in Brazil. So, uh, <clears throat> what about their strategies? Uh, to put it in a nutshell, basically in the BRICS multinationals, the major strategy is what is called a market seeking strategy, OFDI. What does it mean? It means that the company invests abroad to substitute a production in the foreign country to former exports, okay? market seeking, to conquer or to keep a market abroad. <clears throat> the second uh, strategy in significance is resource seeking. So what is this? Investing abroad to secure your raw materials, oil, gas, etc. supply, okay? which is basic, for instance, in Russian investment abroad, but less so in the, in the sphere of our countries. <clears throat> the third one is asset seeking. I invest abroad to secure some uh, crucial asset, namely technological assets. Okay? This is typically the Chinese way of investing. So less than market seeking, of course, and resource seeking, but they, they are very much involved in asset seeking. And I would say that, that the BRICS companies are practically not involved in two, an efficiency seeking uh, strategy. What, what, what is an efficiency seeking strategy? All this refers to Dunning again, okay? <coughs> this concept. So uh, uh, an efficiency seeking OFDI is an OFDI achieved in view of benefiting from lower cost abroad and namely a lower unit labor cost abroad. Okay, this is the definition of efficiency seeking uh, direct investment. <coughs> and you cannot find this uh, practically not with Russian and Brazilian companies, a little bit with some Indian companies and Chinese companies. And the last point, that we can keep for the discussion in a booklet on multinational companies uh, 15 years ago, I've discovered or exhibited that uh, in American companies, European companies, Japanese companies, a number of com multinationals have adopted a so-called global strategy, which consists in mixing, mixing up the four former strategies plus some other aspects like uh, using very much new uh, information communication technologies, uh, competing uh, directly at the global level uh, on the global market, um, having as an objective the, a global profit, global sales, everything global. Okay, So we can come back to, to this strategy. So this strategy is not yet very much developed in, in the BRICS sample. <coughs> About the multinationals from the NUIX, we have less knowledge about that because there is no study except my, my own, okay? But in my own, uh, I found a few things. So you have some state-owned multinationals in the NUIX, namely among the multilatinas from Latin America and also in the oil and natural resource uh, industry. You have also many small and medium-sized enterprises among the multinationals from the NUIX, okay? And as regards to, as regards the, the strategies, so the same. They are much more involved into market seeking than resource seeking, than asset seeking. And I have found only three countries uh, which companies are already involved into uh, efficiency seeking strategy which is investing abroad to lower the cost, namely the unit labor cost. These are companies from Malaysia, of course, Argentina and Thailand, okay? And no one, uh, no one I, I did not discover that one of these companies uh, has a so-called global strategy. So, fifth point. I'm running out of time, no? So, a few words about uh, geographical and industrial distribution of OFDI. So, as regard uh, to the BRICS, they are investing first, I mean Russia, Brazil, etc., are investing first in tax havens, the first location of their OFDI tax havens. Uh, the second in importance is developed market economies, 
The third one is in neighboring developing countries. And they don't invest on very few in further developing uh, countries. For instance, it's very rare to find a Russian company investing in Brazil. It may be, uh, maybe there is one in the sample, but no more. But uh, they invest uh, in their neighborhood, basically, when it is in the developing countries. And wh with my 12 uh, weeks, <coughs> the first area of their investment is neighboring countries. Malaysia is investing a lot in Southeast Asia, for instance. Or Colombia and Chile are investing in other Latin American countries, basically, you know, or in the Caribbean uh, uh, countries. So, and this was the case of BRICS 20 years ago. 20 years ago, China was investing only in Southeast Asia. Uh, Russia was investing only in the former CMA countries. Okay? So, it's an evolution. First, you invest in the neighboring countries, and when you are developing your OFDI, you are going further to tax havens, of course, and developing market economies. <coughs> so another point that, that was uh, shown in table three <coughs> is coined round-tripping OFDI. What is this? Uh, the, the best example is a Russian company is investing in Cyprus, putting, uh, establishing a subsidiary in Cyprus, and this subsidiary in Cyprus invests back to Russia. This is round tripping. So it's a way of uh, uh, tax evasion, or tax avoidance, of course, but not only. It's a way to invest in Russia wi within, uh, without being recognized as a Russian company. And you know that in Russia and China it happens very often. Okay, <clears throat> so it has been assessed that 50% of Chinese investment abroad is round tripping through Macao, Hong Kong. So then comes Hong, Hong Kong in the, into the picture. Okay? <coughs> and we can find some uh, round tripping of the eye from Thailand, Indonesia, Colombia, Mexico, Turkey. What about the industrial structure? Basically, OFDI from the BRICS is invested in the services industry. That is exactly like the big dominant multinational company in the world from the US, Canada, uh, Europe, Japan. Two thirds of worldwide direct investment abroad is in the services industry. So it means, for instance, uh, let me take Exxon. Exxon is no longer an oil company. Yes, of course, they are producing oil. But if you look at the sales of Exxon, you have more than 50% which are services. So it's a service company, Exxon. Car rental and so on and so forth. Okay? So it's normal. Service is first. Then the manufacturing sector. And the last one is the primary sector, which means natural resources. Uh, raw materials, and so on. <coughs> the only exception to this uh, structure is Russia. Because in Russian investment abroad, the primary sector is very important with oil and gas. And also, the manufacturing industry is very important because it's a legacy of the former Soviet heavy industrialization. Okay? <coughs> and among the NWICs, uh, the first point to say is there is a paucity of data. So it's very difficult to conclude of, of industrial data. But uh, from the few data that I've been able to gather, manufacturing is still dominant among the, the industries where OFDI is, uh, is achieved, except for Malaysia, Argentina, and Chile, in which the services industry is the first one. So nearly my next point, the theoretical background which means uh, the Dunning, Dunning's IDP model, IDP for in Investment Development Path. So it's a model in fifth stages uh, of, ID uh, of development. So in the first stage of its economic development, a country, which is at this stage a least developed economy, hosts very few inward FDI and does not invest at all abroad. This is the definition by Dunning of a least developed economy. 
In a second stage, it becomes a developing country. And at this stage, it becomes attractive to inward FDI and achieves its first outward FDI, but being still a net FDI importer. So getting more inward FDI than it, it exports OFDI. In a third stage, which is the most interesting for me, in a third stage, due to its new technolo te technological competence, competences, but also to its still low unit labor cost, a country attracts very significant inward FDI, but its multinational companies start to substantially invest abroad, even though <coughs> the country still remains uh, a net FDI importer. And this is the stage of emerging economies I'm talking about. I, I mean, my samples are supposed to be in this stage. <coughs> in a fourth stage, a country becomes a developed economy, uh, and then it invests more outwards than it is invested uh, from, by foreign investors, and then its FDI balance is positive. Okay. This is the case of many EU countries, for instance. <coughs> and the fifth and last stage, which is nowadays stage for some countries like the US and the UK, for instance, <coughs> they are in a so-called post-industrial stage, and then the country roughly reaches a balance between its inward and outward uh, FDI. And if you check the US and the UK, that's nearly the case. Okay? Uh, there, there is, the balance is nearly zero. <coughs> so the second point in theoretical terms, if you adopt uh, the Dunning's model, <coughs> the, the factors which determine outward foreign direct investments are the so-called push factors. That's to say factors that you have to check in the home country of, of FDI, okay? That is the level of economic dev development in the home country. It's growth, the market size, the technological level in the home country. <coughs> and these factors are predominant as compared to what is sometimes called pool factors which are the factors which are to be used when you study a host country attractiveness to foreign investors. So is a country attractive? <coughs> then you check the development level of the host country, uh, the growth rate of the host country, the inflation rate of the host country, and so on and so forth. So just to finish, I will skip out <coughs> the conclusion on uh, promotion policies. Keeping the Dunning's model in mind, I have already tested it in 2003 on a huge sample of 176 countries, but forget it. I have achieved in my paper, in my recent paper, a test uh, according to equation four. So OFDI is supposed to be explained by the following explanatory variables the GDP of the home country, of OFDI home country, GDP per capita in the home country, small g stands for the economic rate of growth, GDP rate of growth of the home country. Then I have two variables for technological level. X, X high tech is the share of high tech, high tech exports in overall exports, okay? <coughs> and this variable is divided into three classes. Those countries in which this ratio is below 5%, another class number two, where this ratio is between 5 and 25%, and, <coughs> and in finally, a third class in which high tech exports are over 25% of overall exports. <coughs> and the second uh, technological variable is the number of patent registered in the home country. And finally, I introduced the last variable, which is inward FDI in the home country. Why is it so? <coughs> because Matthews, who has uh, written a book on dragon multinationals, about Asian multinationals, <coughs> has tested successfully the following assumption. 
he supposed, he assumed that there was a kind of linkage, leverage, learning effect, which means that a country like India, for instance, has hosted a number of foreign companies. Then these foreign companies started to establish a number of links with local domestic Indian companies. And the Indian companies benefited from these links to start investing abroad in, in turn. Okay? There, was, there was also a leverage effect. Cooperating with foreign multinationals in India, the, the, the productivity of Indian companies has increased and make them more able to invest abroad. <coughs> and there was a learning effect when you are cooperating with an American company or a European company in India, then you can catch uh, some aspect of their technologies. This is a learning effect. <coughs> and a way to check this effect was to introduce uh, uh, inward FDI in my model. So this is the nice results of the economic, uh, econometric models. I'm out of time, maybe. So I finished just with a few words on the table. <coughs> so you, you can see uh, without uh, entering into technical econometrics, but in simple terms, in simple words, the first variable which really explain uh, very significantly uh, uh, outward foreign direct investment from the NWICs, the test has been done only on the NWICs, on the 12 NWICs uh, countries, is GDP in the home country. The second one, which is also extremely explanatory, is GDP per capita. So the level of development and the size of the economy, which is GDP, are absolutely determinant of OFDI. <coughs> then you see that the G G GDP growth rate is significant, but, but less. When you have three stars, it's significant at the 1% th threshold. When you have just one star, it's at the 10% threshold. Okay? So GDP growth rate is significant, but no more than that. And then you see that the high-tech export is significant only for the third class, which is for those countries which have high level of high-tech exports. Okay? Uh, so they are probably a techno technological advantage because they export a high share of technological products and, they, uh, and this can trigger also their OFDI. <coughs> and then for patents, you see that the variable is also extremely significant, but with a negative sign, which means that, which means clearly that the less you have patents in the home economy, the more you invest abroad. So it, it's clearly investments to catch some technological progress which is available abroad and not in your home country, okay? This is the, 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 the interpretation of this uh, neg negative sign. And you see that the so-called uh, linkage, leverage, learning effect is extremely significant. Regard if you look at the, uh, <coughs> the significance of uh, this variable. So I will stop here. Uh, we can go further in the discussion, including on this last point that I have skipped out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, the topic that we will discuss today is the outward foreign direct investment by multinational companies, and we will follow this outline. Uh, first, I will uh, give a brief summary about the papers that the professor or, uh, sent us. The professor already talked about the uh, BRICS and the new wave emerging countries, so I will try to focus on uh, post uh, post-communist transition economies, and then I will also talk a little bit about the uh, trends of uh, OFDI by developing countries, and then I will talk about Russian on FDI and finish it by asking questions. The papers that uh, we received actually uh, mainly discussed about uh, wait a minute. <laughs> The papers that we received uh, mainly discuss about the growth of uh, OFDI by 
uh, post-communist transition economies, BRICS countries, and new wave emerging economies. And it, uh, uh, it uh, discuss uh, the increase of the OFDI in these uh, economies and in these uh, countries. And uh, uh, in case of post-communist transition economies, uh, it is mentioned that Russia is, uh, was one of the largest countries uh, having the large part of OFDI stocks starting from 1994 to 2000. And uh, the share of the OFDI stocks that Russia had in this period was around 60 to 80 percent. And the other thing was mentioning in the paper that uh, in terms of uh, post-communist transition, these countries actually met the golden age around starting from 2000 to 2007 because in this period the uh, growth of OFDI increased uh, significant, significantly in these uh, countries and uh, the papers were also talking about the factors and some uh, strategies that the countries used in order to invest in other countries which a professor already discussed in the uh, presentation and then it was also discussed about the geographical distribution wh where usually these countries invest in which countries uh, some uh, usually they invest in uh, neighboring countries but uh, in case of again uh, post uh, communist transition economies they usually uh, countries invest either in other uh, post communist transition economies or uh, to uh, developed market economies, which is uh, mainly Europe, uh, or some others are even uh, invest in uh, offshoring and tax haven. And last uh, thing was uh, uh, that the last thing is the challenges that these uh, multinational companies will face. Uh, one of the main uh, challenges that the multinational uh, companies faced was the greater recession that happened in 2008, and uh, in. Uh, 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 around uh, from uh, post-communist transition economies, Romania, Slovenia, and Russia, these countries were uh, the, count the, the countries that affected the most uh, uh, during the Great Recession. And even Russia lost uh, around 20% of uh, OFDI stock share uh, in this crisis, in this uh, period. And the, the other challenges are the political stability and implementation of labor laws, that this may happen either in a, uh, home countries or in foreign countries. Uh, for example, in case of Russia, that happened, uh, the, the sanction happened, and uh, Ida will talk about it later. And last one is the competition. When the comp companies uh, try to invest in another country, they usually face uh, competitions with the, with the existing countries in uh, foreign uh, countries. Well, uh, in the paper, they were also mentioning about some uh, some the strategies that I will skip it because Professor already like perfectly described this, so I don't have to repeat it. And so instead, I will try to talk about these uh, graphs that we have. This is the trend uh, that we found from the report from World Bank Group. Uh, that um, says that uh, last two decades, the growth of OFDI in developing countries increased significantly, like starting from 1995 to, uh, to 2015. And as you see in the graph, uh, uh, there is like seven percent. There's like seven percent increase in 1995 to 27 percent in 2014, with the equivalent of 315 billion U.S. dollars. And this graph uh, is the share of OFDI stocks in developing countries, and it uh, also dec it also increased uh, within these periods from by 4% in 1995 to 12% in 2014 with the equivalent of 2.8 trillion US dollars. And this graph, as a uh, professor already mentioned in the presentation, that the BRICS countries are usually the countries that drive the growth of 
OFDI. And we also found this graph that, uh, in this graph it shows that the BRICS countries, uh, Professor in his uh, presentation usually excluded South Africa, but in this one, South Africa is included. So if we look at this graph in 1995, the five BRIC countries, they generate around 62% of the whole of FDI stocks in 1995. And this uh, number actually did not change in 2015. In 2015, it's pretty much the same as if you see the countries. The BRICS countries, they have the large portion of FDI stocks in 2015. Even China became uh, one of the main driven of uh, uh, oh, FDI stuck in 2015. Now, uh, Ida will talk about the uh, Russian OFDI. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, since we are uh, coming from the uh, former Soviet Union countries, I am from Kyrgyzstan and Hayom is from Tajikistan, uh, we decided to uh, pick uh, up Russia from BRICS country and to talk a bit deeper about that. And since we are receiving uh, most of our uh, uh, FDI from Russia, <laughs> we are more, uh, more or less interested in Russian case. Uh, so here you can see the development of uh, Russian OFDI. Uh, uh, since USSR was not really receiving uh, inward FDI, it just started to receive it in 1987. It doesn't really have a spillover effects and even more uh, I since it was collapsed. Um, uh, so the FDI just fall uh, from uh, 600, 700 million to zero. And, but also the collapse of the USSR, uh, it was the reason for the uh, Russian companies uh, to become uh, multinational uh, companies just overnight because uh, since they were operating in different locations in uh, Soviet Union countries, so um, they become uh, multinational. Uh, after that, so uh, si starting from uh, 1993, the o OFDI of Russia was growing very fast. Uh, this was because of the um, super increasing oil prices. Uh, for example, if in, in 1999 uh, the, the price for bar per barrel was uh, $10, uh, it increased to $130 per barrel in 2015. And uh, so this oil boom and spillover effect, effect so it made um, Russia uh, to become a more, more very fast growing um, emerging country. And in 1995, as you can see, the uh, Russia, Russia's outward uh, FD, uh, FDI was uh, 3 billion. And uh, it was growing, uh, as the uh, professor mentioned, it was not really stable because during the crisis it was hit uh, the most uh, comparing to other BRICS countries. But uh, until the 2014, the stock was accumulated until the uh, 400,000 um, billions. And uh, also you can see that the Russia's share in the global outward uh, FDI stock is um, not really huge if you uh, see it in the global level. And as for the ratio between Russia's outward and inward FDI, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so uh, we can say that it's, uh, it's going more or less hand in hand. Uh, why it's uh, happening? M uh, maybe the main reason can be that um, Russia heavily uh, investing in Cyprus, which was uh, yeah mentioned uh, earlier that it's the tax heaven, and uh, uh, the uh, capital is just going around from Russia to Cyprus and uh, uh, and back. So. Uh, yeah, as you can see here, uh, this is the uh, uh, graphical division of Russia's outward uh, FDI stock. Uh, so. 48%, uh, uh, this is the data for 2015 uh, from the, your right side. 48% uh, of Russia's F outward FDI stock is uh, it's investing in Europe. But if you see it from the side of the Europe, so inward uh, FDI to Europe is just um, uh, 1%. And it's not that uh, significant to Europe. And it's, uh, Russia is mostly investing in Austria, Finland, Baltic states, Bulgaria, and as I said, to uh, Cyprus. 
And in US, uh, it's investing just three um, percent, and inward uh, investment of US is just zero point two percent, and China is um, uh, also like eight percent, and uh, the forty one percent is just the other countries, and uh, if we compare this to um, uh, yeah, compared to the uh, European uh, countries and U.S. and China, um, Russia's outward uh, FDI is very much important to CIS countries, uh, to our countries. And it, if you can see to this uh, graph, you can see right in the middle, uh, it's very red. <laughs> it's the inward investment to CIS countries, it's more than uh, 60%, so it's very much significant. Uh, so yeah, uh, following the professor's paper, we will talk about the uh, motivations that are um, that drive uh, Russian firms to invest uh, abroad. Uh, the first is uh, research seeking. So the Russian multinational companies they um, they can see ODI is a personal bank. For example, since there there are no restrictions on capital exports, uh, firms can execute their uh, financial assets abroad. And for example, they can uh, store some finance uh, abroad or use this finance as a collateral and to uh, take some fi uh, foreign loans. And uh, by this, they can um, uh, they can invest in uh, Russia again uh, to support their home production. Uh, also, uh, for the market-seeking strategy, so of course, uh, not uh, the just the small uh, amount of multinational companies of Russia they are using this strategy uh, uh, for the um, expansion and uh, for the. And efficiency seeking strategy, so raising profit margins. Uh, profit margins, uh, as we know, are um, higher at the end of the value chain. And therefore, some Russian uh, multinational companies, they uh, switched from exporter of raw materials to the seller of final goods. As for the tax planning and minimization of customs fee, uh, here we can say that, as we said uh, a, lot of, a lot of times, that uh, Russian firms uh, invest a lot of uh, their investment to tax uh, heaven tax haven countries, but also uh, they uh, can uh, you, um, move their production to uh, uh, abroad because of some uh, domestic uh, restrictions, for example, on exports and to avoid that they're just uh, outsourcing their production. But as for it, and also they, uh, these multinational companies, uh, they can use their own uh, logistical units in other like foreign countries in order to make uh, safer uh, their production so that uh, uh, last consumer will uh, receive their uh, products uh, in a safe way. Uh, as for the strat strategic asset seeking, so we can say that not a lot, uh, just few firms, they are uh, acquiring through merger and acquisition, they are acquiring the advanced Western technology. And uh, the last uh, facts, maybe they are very specific to Russian case, uh, uh, risk aversion. Uh, maybe because of the uh, huge political risk uh, for uh, the Russian firms, they um, they try to diversify their investment and they put uh, some of their foreign assets in uh, foreign countries. Uh, also, uh, the, uh, the Russia can use these multinational companies uh, because of their national interest and uh, as, as uh, pro like pro uh, uh, as their foreign policy objectives. For example, this is happening in our country uh, because uh, somehow Russia uh, wants to take uh, control of uh, less developed countries. And uh, the last uh, reason why uh, uh, companies can uh, uh, use outward foreign direct investment is because um, most of the companies or residents they establish their production of firms abroad because they want to have longer residence permit or visa or even get uh, their citizenship. And 
so, and uh, as for the case of Russia, we think that the sanctions also were the very important issue to look at. Uh, so sanctions were um, implemented in 2014, but not to all uh, Russian uh, firms. It was just uh, 100 Russian citizens and uh, some firms. But uh, s uh, the important thing is that mainly of mul uh, mul <coughs> Russian multinational companies, they are from uh, oil and gas sector or uh, nat other natural resource uh, dependent sectors. And these large oil and gas producers like Rosneft, Lukoil, Gazprom and Novatek or the major banks, Sberbank, Gazprom Bank and Vnishny Konab Bank, uh, they were actually uh, sanctioned. And um, as for the others, it makes them uh, to be more responsible on uh, their investments abroad uh, since they have to uh, report on their investments to Russian government. Also, uh, this uh, uh, this case really disrupts the other multinational companies because when they are operating abroad, it's this business environment can be uh, not uh, really uh, effective for them. And also, it has the indirect uh, effect because sanctions can, uh, as we saw, the deteriorate the uh, ruble exchange rate, which increased the interest rates, and uh, it led to uh, weakness capability to invest abroad and so here we got some issues for a discussion so the first uh, point that uh, the first point that we want to uh, ask is uh, that how to tackle the issue of capital flight in developing countries associated with these multinational companies but here we mainly mean uh, the uh, recipient countries case, for example, uh, when multinational companies, they outsource their production, of course, it's uh, good for developing countries, but uh, since uh, but sometimes they you know, find the more lower cost uh, countries and they again like outsource and how this will affect uh, to recipient countries. And the second is how, the, how does OFDI impact on domestic market, uh, precise on domestic investment, whether it crow uh, crowds out dom domestic investment. And the role of government and OFDI, uh, maybe this will be more um, about uh, the part that you skipped about the uh, policies, how uh, OFDI can be promoted. So our question is whether it should be supported or restricted. Or also we read in your paper that it can be, um, uh, governments can support some uh, particular industries. If it is so, so how to choose these industries and what will happen to other industries uh, in this case. Uh, so we, this is it basically. Thank you very much. Okay, maybe 10 to 15 minutes for the comments and answer okay. the questions, and then we will open the okay. for questions. So, I will uh, react briefly. So first thing that uh, you have provided some value added to what I've said, and uh, I congratulate you not only to go and see other statistics, but uh, to use uh, work by Kari Liuto, who is one of my friends, uh, because uh, we are not so many people working in this area. So he's a Finnish colleague, very, very expert, in, uh, namely on the Russian OFDI. Uh, so uh, the second point I would make is not only to you, but to everyone. Personally, I consider that my slides are or can be available to you. I don't know whether it's uh, usual, but if you would like to have the slides, you are free to have them. And of course, my two articles as well. I don't know. Uh, it's usual, maybe. So, oh, OK. OK, so you have all, all the. Uh, and maybe the last comment before uh, coming into the, the matter is that I don't know whether you, you got it or you checked it. But as I told you, I, I published two months ago uh, an article in Vaprose Economiki, okay, in English, uh, Russian Journal of Economics, which is exactly about uh, the ladies' uh, part of the, the, the comment. It is exactly on outward foreign direct investment from 
post-communist transition economies. So, uh, as you may know, we can delineate the sample as a 25 country sample. So I worked with these 25 countries, which are uh, former uh, Soviet countries and former CMEA countries, okay? But the problem is that for some of them, they are below the threshold of $1 billion, and for some of them, they are even below $100 million, which means they are below the threshold which is checked by the UN. So, for, for instance, for Tajikistan, since you are from Tajikistan, you don't find any data, yeah. even published by the UN. Uh, even though I, I imagine that Tajik, some Tajik companies may invest, uh, let's say, in the neighboring uh, Uzbekistan or something like that. But since it's, it's too tiny to, to be <laughs> taken into account by the UN. Okay? So uh, if I want to have this data, I must go to the central bank of your country. <laughs> okay? So I had to skip out a number of countries, and my working uh, uh, sample is of about 15 or 16 countries. So if you are interested in this paper, or if some of you are interested in this paper, you ask Marc Lavoie to send me an email, and I will send you back this paper just for you. Okay? <coughs> but you will not find Tajikistan anyway. And you are... Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan. Ah, Kyrgyzstan. I've been once in Kyrgyzstan, uh, but uh, <laughs> there, there, are, there, there are no da data again for Kyrgyzstan, uh, neither for Turkmenistan uh, or Uzbekistan. So for the five Central Eastern Europe, Central Asian countries, uh, the, the UNCTAD is not able to publish uh, data which are comparable to other countries, so they skipped out the, the countries. So uh, this is for uh, just for the literature. Uh, about what you have said, uh, I don't disagree uh, with anything. So I would just come back to one or two issues and then to your three question marks. So uh, you will see in, the, in the, the last paper I mentioned, what about Slovenia, Romania, which have been affected downwards. But uh, on the other hand, for instance, a country like Poland has increased its IFDI even during the crisis. So, again, within the sample of post-communist transition economies, uh, OFDI have been unevenly affected by, uh, by the crisis. For, for Poland, it's practically, it's like China. No, they muddled through without any problem. Uh, so, uh, but uh, you, you raise a, a good point. Another point which is really an issue, for me at least, is South Africa. And more generally, I would have a more general comment. So, of course, South Africa is considered in, by some authors as, one of, as the fifth brick, okay? And <coughs> if you compare South, the South African domestic economy, not to China, because China is really different, but to Brazil or to Russia, you can find some similarities. You can accept that it is the fifth brick. <coughs> and of course, it is a country which is uh, investing abroad. So normally I should have it, I should have uh, taken it on board in my BRIC sample. But then I will tell you my story. I started publishing first on Russian multinational company as early as in 2002, I think. Okay? Then step by step, I extended my observation to Chinese companies. Then I published papers comparing Russian and Chinese multinationals. So at the end of the day, I said, OK, why not all the BRICS? But I did not take South Africa. Probably for, uh, I would say, non-rational economic reasons, or not for economists' reasons. Uh, <coughs> my reason is that I've been in South Africa. And uh, it, it's hard to me to consider this country as a BRIC. Simply that. Because on the other hand, I commute to Russia several times per year. I've been several times in China. I've been teaching in Brazil. So I know well three of the BRICS. I never was in India, which is a, a shortcoming in my approach. Okay? And I, knew I was just once in South Africa and did not find that it was so much comparable with the three countries I know among the BRICS. So anyway, it's an excuse. It's an excuse. Uh, so South Africa should be considered 
and you did it, so it's okay. <coughs> uh, 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 last point, maybe, uh, uh, in what, uh, one or two other points. Um, the, on the first part of your uh, presentation, he, it was interesting that you have presented out OFDI from not all developing countries, but of many developing countries. If I check your presentation, some are in my samples, some are not. Uh, okay, so but uh, the, we have an issue with the world with the word developing country because among the developing countries, you have at least three or four different kinds of developing countries. You have the so-called least developed countries. Please find me a multinational company investing abroad from Burundi. <laughs> Difficult. Difficult. Maybe even from Tajikistan. No, but, but I would not say that. But from Burundi or, or Rwanda and countries like that. Nobody, or from Nepal. Okay, so you have the least developed. Then you have what I would call the average developing countries. And they invest very few abroad. And then you have among developing countries, the emerging countries I'm talking about. But you have other categories. You have also tax havens. So they invest a lot. The Virgin Islands is one big investor abroad. <laughs> but the money is not from Virgin Islands. So they are, they are a kind of hub in the round tripping process I talked about. Okay? Uh, but uh, Tad is not considering that it's a hub. They are taking the statistics. Well, Virgin Islands is a, uh, an important investor abroad. You know? so, uh, and finally, you have these uh, countries that I have call, called, coined, uh, oil and gas or natural resource run depending countries. Okay? There, some of them are classified within developing countries, but they are very specific. So, of course, it is, but the, the, what you have shown is true. The, the, the pace uh, of development uh, for OFDI from developing countries uh, was faster and passed over the pace of OFDI from developed countries. And this is true even, even but it's even more true for emerging countries. Okay. So, <clears throat> so that's it. And maybe just one thing about uh, Russian uh, multinationals, but this would apply also to multinationals. So you will find this in my last paper for multinationals from former Yugoslavia and former Czechoslovakia. In those countries which have been split up overnight, or nearly overnight, like the former Soviet Union, <coughs> appeared in these countries what Kariliuto himself uh, coined uh, born multinational companies, or born multinationals, because they were born overnight as multinational. Let's imagine a, com uh, a company was based in Moscow, had some subsidiaries in Kyrgyzstan, in Moldova, in Ukraine, and so overnight, because Mr. Yeltsin signed something, the company became a multinational. And the same applies for uh, the burst out of, Yugosl of the Yugoslav Republic and the Czechoslovak Republic. Okay? So it's a very specific, it's just a single occurrence in the history. It's a, absolutely unique. Okay? So, <coughs> about the issues, <coughs> there are indeed issues. <laughs> First, so capital flight. Capital flight has plagued, namely Russia, in, in the early 1990s. Because at the beginning, a part of the money flowing uh, abroad from Russia and from the former Soviet Union were simply capital flight. <coughs> and if you like this topic, you have to read some uh, old papers by Luto. He worked a lot on this, and it's very difficult to check what is a capital flight and what is a foreign direct investment. No. 
because some, capi some capital can fly abroad temporarily. But at the end of the day, since the, the investment climate is not improving in Russia, it will be invested abroad. So at, at this moment, it's no longer a capital flight. It's a foreign direct investment. And of course, for statistical institutes or for the central banks, which usually help, are holding the data about uh, foreign direct investment, <coughs> it's very di difficult to, to check whether it's really capital flight or not. Of course, in Russia, <coughs> the amounts were so big in, in the 1990s, uh, before 1999, so much money flew away from Russia and from the former Soviet Union for non-investing purpose, sim simply for safety purpose, not to be uh, put uh, uh, under the umbrella you know, of the mafia or whatever. <laughs> if you had money, you had to put it out of Russia. It was safer than to keep it in Russia. So they had a lot of capital flight. <coughs> but there are also some capital flights in many emerging countries as well. So how to deal with it, it's a, a complicated statistical issue. So it means that only the central banks can do that, not the UNCTAD. If we work with the UNCTAD, UNCTAD data, which is what I'm doing, very, uh, very difficult to disentangle uh, capital flight from foreign direct investment and the other, other way around. So on your second issue, uh, <coughs> This is a very interesting point. Usually, if you look at the overall literature about OFDI, and <coughs> you attempt to, to check wh which is the impact of OFDI on an economy, the, the great bulk of the literature is checking the economic impact on the host economy. Saying, for instance, are the American companies, the Yankee companies, having, having a good impact or a negative impact when they are investing in India, etc. <coughs> so the 99% of the literature about the impact of outward FDI is about the impact on the host economy. Okay? And <coughs> just by chance, last year, in this journal, which is Transnational Corporations, published by UNCTAD, one guy said, okay, I think it, it is about, it's a paper about Indian, Indian multinationals. And he started up the paper saying, okay, usually we are looking or we are checking the impact of Indian or what FDI onto Sri Lanka, onto some host countries. But now I intend to write my paper on the economic impact of outward FDI from India onto the domestic economy in India. Exactly your point. And he checked the literature and he did not find more than, a, let's say, a dozen paper, papers about that since the 60s. So it's not, uh, it's an unheeded issue, in a sense. It's an unheeded issue in the literature. You have so many papers on the economic impact on the host economy and so few about the impact on the domestic economy. <coughs> and my guess, or reading this paper by this Indian uh, economist, I'm really convinced that we have to to be more careful about this. Uh, and if someone here intends to write his or her PhD dissertation or master thesis or whatever <coughs> on a good topic, this is a good topic. But rather difficult because you have only about 10, 10 papers available, no more, in the, in the world literature. So it's a, it's a good point. And so the role of government Uh, how can I come back? Maybe your help. <laughs> can I come back to my own file? Are you okay? Uh, okay yeah. Which one? 
So your, your last point is about my conclusion or what should have been my conclusion. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is like that. I can, it can go. Okay. So my last point was more or less about your your third question. What is the role of government? <coughs> ah, F5. Oui, okay. Uh, oui, c'est sûr. Okay, that's okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, my conclusion was exactly about this: the role of government uh, uh, to, toward uh, outward foreign direct investment, uh, we, we, which is called usually OFDI promotion policies. You know? And of course, <coughs> here you have also uh, very different situations uh, across the country. So I would not make all my slides, but to put it in a nutshell, <coughs> the strongest prom OFDI promotion policy among all the countries I've been studying is in China. At the very beginning in China, uh, OFDI was strictly controlled and promoted together. Okay, So when you intended to, in you, I'm a Chinese uh, uh, businessman, I intend to, to invest abroad, I had to have the agreement of the State Council, wow. the State Council, then of the MOFCOM, MOFCOM is the Ministry uh, of Foreign Trade, then <laughs> the agreement of the SASAC, SASAC is a state agency for state-owned assets, because most of the investors are, are state-owned, then from the SAFE, SAFE is the Foreign Exchange Agency, Sometimes of the local community as well. <coughs> Until 2003, it was extremely controlled. So after 2003, they opened up, or the, the promotion policy became more relaxed, I would say, or more liberal in a sense, okay? <coughs> Nevertheless, as it is shown on these slides, 160 state-owned enterprises in 2010 were making up for 84% of overall OFDI basically state-owned, okay? Uh, so it has been a little bit li uh, liberalized in the past recent years. So in Russia, <coughs> there is no such uh, promotion policy like in China. But anyway, uh, I would say the government is, promo is attempting to promote OFDI, but not with a strict policy like in China, much more with watchwords. So uh, Putin is coming to uh, an assembly of businessmen and he's saying, you must invest abroad. Copy China. Make like the Chinese. Do like the Chinese. Oh, okay. It's not really. And on the other hand, and this is the Lyoto's, Kari Lyoto's argument, also Russia is utilizing uh, companies, Russian companies, as a tool for uh, the overall government, governmental policy namely for the foreign policy. If, if, you, if you have a state-owned uh, oil company like Rasneft, okay, you can use it. Namely, when you are sanctioned by the West, you can use it to sanction the West, not sending oil or decreasing your supply of oil. You see? So, it's very complex in the case of Russia. There is a, a kind of policy, but which is not exactly uh, a promotion policy. <coughs> so in India, everything, so until 1991, there, there were strong restrictions against OFDI in India. <coughs> you have to remember that India was a centrally planned economy from the early 50s to 1990. It was a centrally planned economy, not exactly as the Soviet Union was, but it was a centrally planned economy. And just to give you one proof, one of the best mathematical models of economic planning is due to Mahala Nobis, who was Indian, he was uh, the economic advisor of the central planner. <coughs> and he's simply uh, derived from 
uh, Marx, in fact. It's a kind of Marxist model of economic planning. Okay. So, and then in, in 1991, India started liberalizing <coughs> OFDI step by step. The steps are on the slide. I will not comment. And in Brazil, <coughs> there is no explicit promotion policy. <coughs> and as I will tell you in a, oops, in a few words, uh, no. <coughs> and in the, in the weeks, I'm not able to tell you many things about that. Come on. No, no, ça, ça. Uh, so, uh, ah, ah, okay. <laughs> oui, je veux bien retourner à mon document. <laughs> What did I do? <laughs> F5, ça suffit. Ah, OK. Ah, OK. Ah oui, mais là, ça ne marche plus. Hein. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, OK. And just to finish, uh, as regards the government policy in the 12 weeks or 13 weeks, it's still a research in progress. Because uh, I have to check many, many things. I, and I, I have not done it so far. That's it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Professor, for the comments and answering the questions. Okay. So we will open the floor for questions. If it is okay, maybe we can uh, collect around like three to four questions, and then. Okay. Uh, there's one. Thank you so much, Doctor. Your um, uh, presentation was very insightful. I read your paper. And um, I wanted, uh, because you had done a lot of work on relating to India and Pakistan's economy, uh, um, uh, basically my point of view was if we, if we talk about outflows of uh, foreign direct investments from these countries, uh, we are still, we have to accept the fact that we are still developing countries, but we have to look into the case scenarios of these countries. Because in terms of Pakistan, for instance, there is a huge debate going on and a lot of processions had been held in the country because of the fact that uh, people who are doing these outward foreign direct investment are usually the political people and the elites of the country. And uh, the debate which is going on is basically the money should be kept into the country instead of taken out of the country. And most of the governments have been let down due to that. And the basic problem is not just the money. The basic problem is the money that has been attained, uh, f uh, th that is drawn into these foreign direct investment and the outflows of foreign direct investment is basically the money that is taken out through corruption. And to make that black money, white money, so they transfer them to the Swiss accounts and then never these Swiss accounts have no tax accountability and they are never counted. And in all over the world, then they count them as one of the best foreign direct uh, uh, outward flows and what I feel like it's kind of a red taping which is not at all beneficial for the country but it's kind of uh, making the people more paralyzed in the economy and no one is happy with that and like I want you to just shed some light on that like because it's a very controversial point of view <laughs> like I think we both have <coughs> may I respond right now you are from Pakistan I imagine yeah, yeah. okay I just landed once in Karachi so uh, when you say that you, know, you have a knowledge about the Indian and Pakistanis economy, it's not true. Uh, I have no knowledge about it, except general knowledge. So uh, I would respond in two or three points. The first point is uh, that you must be happy because Pakistan in, is in my sample. <laughs> this is the first good news. Beca because usually if you check the samples of emerging economies, Pakistan is not within, it is out. Okay. So the first thing is that if we take into account a variable such as OFDI, Pakistan comes up into the category of emerging economies. Good news first. Then in the background of this good news, you have bad news. You have to take one or two of them. So uh, the, the second point is, but uh, I would tell you that they are not all specific to Pakistan. So I would extend the discussion uh, to, to in a broader uh, with a broader view. So one issue is exactly that a number of foreign investments are, I would say, politically driven. Even, uh, 
they can be done by political people, as just you mentioned. Or <coughs> in Russia, Putin is not investing abroad himself, but he is driving a lot of investment abroad. Putin or his government. Okay? So this is a big issue, which is, so you are in the background of these two issues. One is an issue of corporate governance. Because in fact, these companies, some companies are not independent from political power. This is, a, so it creates a problem of uh, corporate governance. And for instance, <coughs> I mean, in some versions of my paper, I have written about China, about the Chinese state-owned multinational companies that in fact, <coughs> they are benefiting of a kind of communist or socialist advantage. Because nowadays, the government, the Chinese government, is ready to help, <coughs> that to say, to, uh, to bail out any Chinese multinational which is going to be bankrupt. Which is exactly the same as in the former communist system. And this is an advantage for Chinese companies competing on the world market. So, political intervention is always an issue of corporate governance. And afterwards, it's also uh, an issue of overall political governance. Should political powers and economic powers uh, be intertwined? This is a big issue. It's not only an issue for economists, it's also an issue for political scientists. So I would just make the point like that. <coughs> Your second point is, why not keep the money into the country instead of investing it abroad? So the less you are developed, the more this question is relevant. So since I don't know Pakistan enough, I would tell you what was the Indian policy. In the 60s, in the 60s and 70s, the, the Indian government policy was to restrict, to some extent, outward foreign direct investment with exactly this uh, point in mind, saying we need investment in, in India, so why investing abroad? So in this period of time, it was necessary to ask uh, the right to invest abroad to some official authorities and the government, maybe. Okay? And step by step, they liberalized since the 1990s. So I can understand that some people in Pakistan may have the same feeling. I'm not saying that it's good or no, bad, but it's understandable at least, and corruption. <coughs> so corruption is <coughs> coming increasingly into my life, not because I'm corrupted or I'm corrupting anyone, but because to my view, it's becoming a global issue. A global economic issue is corruption. So. I would give you two, kind of, two kinds of comments. The first one is about this topic. <coughs> as, I, as I have shown, you have a bad governance in Chinese multinational companies or in Russian multinational companies, maybe less. It's less an issue in Indian companies. But anyway, it is an issue. People are corrupt. The, the basic economic phenomenon which emerged from the post-communist com trans transition is corruption. And this is due to one uh, specific phenomenon in which I was involved as an economic advisor. You may know that in, it applies maybe to some extent to India as well, but I will take the example of Russia <coughs> or former CIS countries in which or former CMEI countries, in which have operated in the 1990s an, an economic advisors of some governments, including the Russian government. My message was against the IMF and the World Bank, don't privatize the economy overnight. Because if you do it overnight, you will privatize companies which are not privatizable. They were in the red. They were in bank, bankrupt. They were old-fashioned. They need restructuring and so on and so forth. You could not sell them onto the market. So what happens in this case? 
in, in, in particular, if you speed up the privatization overnight, you get immediately a lot of corruption. And this is exactly what happened in all the former communist countries. Now, <clears throat> if you are priva but privatization did not stop at the border of post-communist countries. You, we have had in the 1980s a lot of privatization in Latin America and, and, and also in the 1990s. Maybe less in Asia, but in some Asian countries you have had privatization. And as soon as you have privatization in a developing countries, you have immediately corruption. Immediately corruption. So the so-called wave of privatization, liberalization, etc., is the best trigger for corruption. And it, is so, it, it has gone so far uh, that I've published in 2013 a paper with a new concept of what is the capitalist economy today <clears throat> that I have defined it as a greed-led economic system. Greed means also that you are ready to corrupt anyone to, to gain some uh, money. Okay? So it's, it's not precisely a, a case with Pakistan. It's much more widespread in many, many developing countries, I would say all developing countries. Many political leaders in developing countries have a Swiss bank account. Until now it was secret, so they are moving to other countries to Virgin Islands or in some countries where it's still secret because, because it's no longer secret in, in Switzerland, okay? But this is a big issue. <coughs> and the second reason for me why it is a big issue is that it has not been mentioned yet. My last area of uh, economic research is sports economics. And <laughs> a, major, a major topic in sports economics nowadays is corruption. You open the newspaper every day, you have corruption in sports, okay? So it's so, it's, it, it has uh, grown to such an extent that I've been suggested by a publisher to write down for the first time in my life a whole book in English. So far I, I was able to write articles in English, but not a whole book. So now my challenge is <coughs> to write a uh, whole book in English within a year, I give you the perspective title, which is An Economic Roadmap to the Dark Side of Sport. And one big chapter is about corruption. Okay, that's it. Okay, uh, Maria, please introduce yourself and your country. Uh, hello, my name uh, is Mariam Atalla. I'm from Egypt, so I'm also honored by having my country on my exactly. <laughs> on your list. <laughs> um, my question is a bit uh, general. Um, so, um, like, what's the significance of having to put all these countries together and signifying them as uh, uh, the new wave of emerging countries, um, and? somehow trying to compare them with uh, BRICS because I can understand that, uh, for example, the BRICS are somehow homogenous, uh, perhaps also not very much when it comes to political uh, <laughs> and in, in institutional uh, environment, but it's, it's very much the same in the new list. Um, like, I, if, I, if I try to think about a, a common feature or economic feature or political feature is very hard to find this and so uh, h how like what's the message behind trying to to have these these countries in one group and comparing them to to the BRICS thank you okay so okay Uh, my name is Thiago, uh, option B. Thanks for the presentation. I would like to understand better why OFDI would be the main uh, indicator or car characteristic for the for a country to be an emerging country, 
or is, is you ma you mentioned some ratios like oh if the uh, GDP has to be bigger than five percent or OFTI oh, over uh, FDI uh, twenty five percent, and I would like to know if it's uh, an extra indicator for a country to be an emerging country or would be the main indicator. I please uh, develop more on that. Thanks. Any other questions? No. Okay. okay. So let's go with these two. So the first one is very interesting question because it traces. You did not trace it, but in the background of your question, there is a kind of methodological issue. You can decide when you are working in economics, let's say. You can decide that you have to stick what is existing. So let's imagine you want to work on OFDI. There is an institution which is called the EU, European Union. So I will work on OFDI from the EU countries. OK? So in this case, you have no methodological issues. You take your sample is done from the very beginning. My position is quite different. My position is that when you start up a research in economics, you have to define what is the purpose, what is the concept. So my concept is, let's say, the learning model in the background. And then what is the area of empirical evidence to which it pertains correctly. This is exactly what I have done. Since I have said, OK, I don't accept the definition of emerging countries which is provided by the World Bank or by the OECD or by Goldman Sachs or by, by anyone, M my purpose is to study OFDI from countries which are investing a lot abroad. Okay. So I checked those countries investing a lot abroad, and step by step, I, dedu I deduced or subtracted other groups of countries, and then I was left with the so-called emerging countries. If, <coughs> if uh, I had presented this paper, let's say, at the UN 15 years ago, everyone would have been whistling against me. What, what, what is the, this? group of countries, bizarre. It's a motley crew. No, it's not a motley crew. It's not a motley crew if you consider that the problem to be studied is that you have now countries in the world that are investing at the fastest pace than the usual big investors, which are North American economies, European economies, and Japan. Okay. There are newcomers in the field. So four or five of the newcomers were well known, the BRICS. But what I've checked is in the statistics, you have a number of other countries, my 12 or 13 countries. And then I said, I have to, to find out a kind of analysis for these countries. Okay? So it's not simply an empirical sample. It has a meaning as regards the analysis of outward foreign direct investment. And I think that your, your point is very interesting, but you are right saying there is nothing politically in common between these 12 or 13 countries. So one advantage of the BRICS so far <coughs> compared with the NWICS is that the BRICS started up institutionalizing their existence they have created a common bank. They have created different institutions. <coughs> and they have meetings with the f four or five countries, <coughs> which is not the case, of course, of my second sample. So in this sense, you are correct. So as regard, so <coughs> we, what is my message? Uh, what is the message from this? Is we all economists, we are neglecting you know, analysis so far, those countries which are the more dynamic, the most dy dynamic in terms of OFDI. Because we are focusing on North America, EU, okay? 
then we are focusing on the BRICS, but we are missing 12 or 13 countries which are major investors abroad. And we have to focus on them as well. This is the message. <coughs> and this is the reason why the paper, this paper has been published in the US, but it has been asked to me to be published in at least half a dozen journals. Okay? In this case, I was not submitting the paper. The journals were submitting to me the idea to be published, which is very nice for a researcher. Ask Marc Lavoie, he will confirm. Okay? So, it's a, you are on the good side of the market. You are on the, uh, the supply side when you have an excess demand. <coughs> so, the second, the second question. <coughs> so, <coughs> my reference... Uh, is OFDI is not per se an indicator of emergence. Not really. But I have two references. In the background of what I'm saying, there is the so-called Dunning model. Because Dunning, so I suggest you to, to read Dunning. Uh, he's dead now, but he was really the le leading economist in the area of foreign direct investments in, in the late uh, 19th century and even in the early 20th century. Okay, so Dunning made a connection between the level of economic development of a country and its inward and outward FDI flows. Okay, so when you are the least developed, you are not involved in FDI basically. To put it in other words, you are not involved in globalization. Okay? And then you have a controversial issue in, in the background of this. When I was young, of your, about your age, so it means more than 15 years ago, the idea was that foreign direct investment was bad for host countries because it was the sign that you were dominated by American imperialism or something like that. Uh, bullshit. <laughs> okay. But it appeared that it was not so. It appeared in the 80s and the 90s that those least developed countries were those countries which were less invaded by American and European capital. That's, that's an issue, okay? So it means that the, the old ideas about imperialism have been to be considered the second time, you know? And in this respect, Dunning is not that wrong. He says, okay, when you are very at the bottom of development, you have no contact, nearly no contact with FDI. Then when you are developing, you are more attractive and you are more able to invest abroad. And yet it happens uh, a moment when you reach a threshold when you have your own multinationals, but you are absolutely invaded by foreign direct investors. And this is what the way he defines emergence, you know? And I stick to this, at least in these studies, uh, in a philosophical area, uh, maybe respond in a different way. But for empirical studies, it's very useful to have this. <coughs> and the second point is an historical reference. What was, what were the most developed countries in the world if you look back, let's say one or two centuries ago? Two centuries ago, the most developed economy in the world was the English economy. It was in the mid uh, 18th century, yeah, in the mid 18th century, it was the only country with significant foreign direct investment abroad. And it remained the leading country, both in terms of economic development and in terms of investing abroad until the beginning of the interwar period. 
and it's only during the interwar period that the US investment abroad became bigger than the English one. But it's also in this interwar period that the US became the first significant economy in the world. So this relationship between economic development and foreign direct investment seems relevant not only in the Dunning framework, but if you have an historical scope. Okay? And if, you, if I put France into the picture, big, uh, France was probably the second most developed economy after the English one in the late 18th century, early 19th century, etc. Okay? It was a major investor abroad, namely in Russia. Namely in Russia, where the first, France was the first investor in, in Russia. And then in the interwar period, we regressed, and now we are the fifth or the sixth or whatever, both in terms of economic development and in terms of foreign direct investment. So it seems to me that there is a kind of, re whatever the way you justify it, there is a kind of relationship between foreign direct investment and economic development. And this is my uh, justification. Any other questions? Yeah, one, no. two. Okay, then we'll take this two. I'm Ettore. Option B from Italy. From uh, Italy? Yes, and I have actually a question on imperialism. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <You're> welcome. <laughs> so recently, uh, Branko Milanovic and other researchers. So I know him personally. Yeah, so I mean, not the last Trotskyist militant <laughs> on the face of the earth. But <laughs> uh, he, he published an article on FDI imperialism and tendency to inequality and tendency to war. So my question was: if we don't define the, if we don't see uh, any relation between imperialism and FDI, how uh, would you how would you justify and uh, how would you uh, judge the rise of China on the global scale, and if this if the uh, FDI, especially outward FDI in China, if, if you think that they really don't have any impact on the, on the geopolitical tensions that are rising on the global scale. Okay. Hello. Uh, well, my name is Brenda. I'm from Argentina. From? Uh, from Argentina. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to ask, uh, you have mentioned about this uh, causal relationship between economic development and OFDIs. Uh, I would like to ask about the possibility of an inverse relationship that OFDIs also in some stages contribute to economic uh, development because in the case of South uh, of East Asian countries, there is a lot of literature that uh, analyzes how uh, this is the case. Well, thank you. Okay. So uh, the, the, the Italian question is, we, we can talk about four hours, uh, but uh, so at the moment in my life, I was nearly Marxist. The, the, the only thing which avoided me to be Marxist is that I read the capital in depth and that I noticed a number of internal contradictions. And in my thesis, I published it including with mathematical demonstration that Marx was wrong. So I would stop it here, okay? <laughs> but I have a good knowledge of Marxism. Uh, just to say that imperialism, which is a Marxist idea at the very beginning, okay? Uh, it's, it's something which is, to my view, as politically meaningful and economically meaningless. So if you talk about imperialism in political terms, I can discuss with you many days long, no problem, since I would consider you as a polit political scientist and I would consider myself as an economist and uh, to some extent it's difficult to reconcile a political scientist and uh, an economist. Uh, now, wha what to my view was wrong is the economic analysis of imperialism. So if you like very much imperialism, 
I think, and if you consider that Lenin is one of the most significant, you can say Trotsky as well, but, uh, yeah, or Hobson before. So, so if you take Hobson and Lenin, what, were, what they were saying about imperialism with respect to foreign direct investment, they were saying and they were given proofs that developed countries were investing in what we could call less developed countries at the moment, which were colonies or even though they were not colonies, they were less developed countries. So in a, in a part in the first chapter of my PhD dissertation, I checked very ancient data of the 19th century and early 20th century about foreign direct investment. Okay, I've checked this and I was able to show, but I'm not the only one, Mira, Mira Wilkins in the US has, has been doing the same kind of studies. So what we have checked is that indeed in the late 19th century, early 20th century, three quarters of foreign direct investment were investments from developed countries into developing countries, colonies and so on, okay? And what was say, what we are saying, Hobson and Lenin, they were saying oh, FDI, oh, FDI is an economic way for developed countries to have a power over developing countries. So in, in a sense, the two ideas were fitting. The, the geographical distribution of FDI and the ideas of Lenin Hobson were fitting together. Now, if you look in the post-war period, and namely since the 1980s, 1990s, over three quarters of world FDI are an investment of developed countries into developed countries. Big imperialism of the US over the EU countries and of the EU countries over uh, the US and of Japan as well, because Japan is, is the triad. Are imperialists each, they are imperializing each other. Well, what is the meaning of this? Nonsense, nonsense, okay? And to be a little bit provocative, in foreign direct investment by developed countries into developing countries is peanuts. And this is not an issue for developed countries. It is an issue for developing countries, which are missing capital, which are missing capital. You see? And how can I fit this with Lenin's or Hobson's ideas? Very difficult. So my conclusion is, as an economist, imperialism is a very nice idea to be debated for political scientists, for economists, it's either old fashioned or a dead end. A dead end. Okay? <laughs> but you have to think of, we can discuss hours about that. So this is for, and of course, China, so is China a new imperialist country, which was in the background of your uh, remarks? Of course, China is becoming a new dominating country. But saying that is not a proof of imperialism. Okay? It's simply uh, uh, the sign. Well, all what I'm saying is that capitalism has a strongest law than any other law law between quotation marks, much stronger than the imperialism, which is uneven development. And if you are Trotskyist, you can like it. <laughs> okay, so the, the, the rule of capitalism is development, but uneven de development. And the more capitalism is developing, the more inequalities and disparities is in are increasing. This is Piketty's work. He's right about that. For instance, just to give this as an example. So, and China now is benefiting. 
some Chinese are benefiting from uneven development because they are becoming the richest oligarchs in the world after some American uh, uh, big, big guys and after some Russian oligarchs. I'm not meaning that all the Chinese are benefiting from that. Okay. So the, the second question about, I'm not sure that I've got your point uh, precisely. Uh, your idea is that the fact that a country in Asia is developing a lot of foreign direct investment may boost its development. Well, am I correct? Yeah. So, yeah. This is again the, the idea which has been raised by your, uh, your, co uh, your mates, which, is, uh, which was the last, uh, the last question, uh, one of the questions, which is, what is the impact of OFDI on the domestic economy, on the home economy? And we need more studies about that. Because my intuition, I will not say more, is that indeed, when you are a country, Malaysia is a country investing abroad a lot, and this has probably helped Malaysian economic development. Because I would not be surprised if in the coming 10 or 20 years, Malaysia will apply for OECD membership. Because Malaysia today resembles South Korea 20 years ago. Both investing abroad a lot and both developing developing at a fast pace. So probably if your intuition is that OFDI may be beneficial to economic development and may be a sign of economic development, I would agree with you. But we, we require more study about that. In the literature, we have not enough study to, to make this uh, firm conclusion. But your, I, I would agree with your intuition. I guess there is no more questions. Thank you very much, Professor, for the discussion. Thank you.